Turning Tides is an Antics Entertainment affiliate. You can find us on social media at The Turning Tides Podcast on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. For more information or if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, please email us at the turning tides podcast at gmail.com. Antics Entertainment is an independent multimedia production company founded in Las Vegas, Nevada. We are a collaborative whose main mission is to relate to our audience and create art that makes people feel seen. Antics works with artists in the Vegas community to create music, movies, live shows, series, web comics, and podcasts. If you'd like to keep up with our work, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and YouTube at Antics Ent, A-N-T-I-K-S-E-N-T. And if you're interested in collaborating, shoot us an email at anticsent at gmail.com. Thank you for your support. The following episode contains graphic descriptions of violence and mature language and themes. Hello, everyone. I'm Joseph Pascone. And today, I'm very proud to introduce the inaugural episode of Turning Tides. The first is a five-part series on the Italian independence movement, or, as it is most famously known, the Risorgimento. This show would not be possible without the love and hard work of my soulmate and co-producer, Melissa Marie Brown, as well as the support and love of my family back home. Today's episode will exclusively cover the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars and their effect on Italy. Over the next four installations, I will cover a century of Italian history, culminating in the infamous Battle of Adua in 1896. So without further ado, this is Turning Tides, Italian Footsteps. Episode 1. Revolutionary Change in the Peninsula of Constancy, 1796 to 1815. What is culture? Dr. Yuval Noah Harari states, quote, <clears throat> Myths and fictions accustom people, nearly from the moment of birth, to think in certain ways to behave in accordance with certain standards, to want certain things, and to observe certain rules. They thereby created artificial instincts that enabled millions of strangers to cooperate effectively. This network of artificial instincts is called culture. So culture is the sum of all human imagination. Now, of course, cultures change over time. There's a reason Bible verses about not wearing two kinds of fabric, or the many verses about redistribution of wealth, aren't as popular today. But allow me to pose an unusual question. You ever heard of a manufactured culture? What I mean to talk about in this series is a culture that came about simply because those with power and authority made it so. I can think of plenty of African or Middle Eastern countries whose borders are simply lines on a map which were drawn by colonial powers. In each of these situations, there has always been a large-scale revolt resulting in either independence or continued colonial occupation. For example, the various Kurdish uprisings that took place in northern Iraq, or the lumping together of culturally diverse Congolese and Angolan people by their Portuguese overlords. However, this segment of Turning Tides will detail a culture that was manufactured in less than a hundred years out of whole cloth. Today we'll be talking about the country of Italy. We have made Italy. Now we must make Italians. This is a famous quote from Massimo di Eseglio. He was the Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Sardinia Piedmont from 1849 to 1853. He went on to serve as a senator for the new Kingdom of Italy until his death in 1866. Within this period, the Kingdom of Sardinia Piedmont 
which existed solely as an intra-regional kingship in the northwest of Italy, went on to unite an entire peninsula along with the island of Sicily. The craziest part of this whole story is that the actual unification of the land into one political entity took place in under 15 years. And most of the unification process happened during a war which lasted under three years. The war for Italy, of course, started years and years before this, with Napoleon's roughshod advance across Italy and Central Europe, and his meteoric rise from depressed NCO to emperor of the greater part of Europe. This would pave the way for a burgeoning Italian empire knocking on Ethiopia's door with an army of 40,000, bent on bringing the native peoples to heel and subjecting them to the depravity of colonization. Prior to the events which I will cover today, the idea of one unified Italian nation was an idea which was so strange and so obscure that the last time you could find a single Italian country was when the Roman Empire spread Latin language and culture throughout much of Europe and North Africa. In time, this allowed for the creation of French, Spanish, Italian, as well as the other Romance languages. Since then, parts of Italy have been controlled by the Holy Roman Empire, the Islamic Caliphates, Norman Vikings, and Habsburgs from Madrid to Vienna. We begin our story in 1796. Europe is possibly more fractious than it has ever been. Hundreds of years of war have left places like Germany and the Italian peninsula in complete devastation and depopulation. The years of religious warfare and land-based wars over secession had left battle scars all over the Italian countryside. On the same land where the Renaissance once flourished, in the fields of science and art, Italy can boast the names of Galileo and Caravaggio, and a dozen other household names. However, in their day there was no Italian state. They belonged respectively to the Duchy of Florence and the Duchy of Milan. These men likely worked and died without the slightest inkling that Italy could, or even should, be united. To have such an idea during this time would have guaranteed your imprisonment, and additionally could have led to your execution. With that in mind, I believe it is important to break down Italy's geography. When looking at a modern topographical map of Italy, its central location within the Mediterranean Sea is apparent. The terrain is enhanced by the Alpine mountain range, which hems in the northern part of the peninsula. The Apennine Mountains divide the land down the center, cutting Italy's famous boot in two. The fertile rivers and the seas into which they funnel are the most life-sustaining feature of the Italian peninsula. The Po, the Tiber, and the Adige are but a few of the many large coastal rivers which made Italy the breadbasket it had been for thousands of years. The Adriatic, Ligurian, and Tyrrhenian seas surround Italy and create the pools into which these great rivers flow. During its early history, Italy seemed to be a melting pot for all different kinds of Iron Age cultures. And while no census was taken, one could imagine it was a land filled with Phoenicians, Trojans, Greeks, Celts, and native Italic tribesmen, all jockeying for position and resources within the fertile river valleys and natural harbors of the peninsula. This central location was a blessing and a curse. Famously, all roads led to Rome. And this allowed for a clear invasion route for various, quote-unquote, barbarian tribesmen of Germany and east-central Eurasia. These invasions caused the wealth of the thousand-year-old Roman Empire to come crashing down, parceled out in the form of appeasement and bribes. This also led to the destruction of Italy as a single, unified political body. For hundreds of years, that is how it remained. Italy was either directly or indirectly controlled by foreign entities who were bent on exploiting Italian people and their resources in order to finance their own wars. This is exemplified in the South and in Sicily especially. 
throughout the world, whether it's the Irish being subjugated in their own country by the British or the Polish having their country split and devoured like a wedding cake by the Russians, Prussians, and Austrians, it was apparent that a pattern was emerging in how smaller native peoples would be treated. A major trend throughout history has been the big charging in, dominating, and erasing the small. Italy and Italians were no strangers to this. The Italian language was essentially phased out by the 18th century. In fact, only 2% of people inhabiting Italy at the time could speak Italian, most citizens preferring their local dialects. This led to intense regionalism, with your country being whatever city or region you were born in. There were similar patterns of cultural destruction in Prague, where Czech was being supplanted by German as the Italian language was phased out for French. In the years prior to the revolutions in America and France, the Italian political and geographical landscape was as it had been for many years. Various states existed, each with their own dialects and cultures. Villages, which were in proximity to one another, were sure to share a common language. But if you were to meet someone from the northwest city of Turin and drop them in the Sicilian countryside, their chances of being understood were slim to none. From west to east, these were the names of the Italian states prior to Napoleon's advance. The Kingdom of Sardinia Piedmont, whose capital city was Turin, the Republic of Genoa, the Duchy of Milan, the Duchy of Parma, the Duchy of Modena, the Duchy of Massa and Carrara, the Republic of Lucca, the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, the thousand-year-old Republic of Venice, the Papal States, whose capital was Rome, and finally, the Kingdom of Naples, soon to be renamed the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. If this was a lot for you to hear, it was a lot to say. But it does give us an idea of how fractured Italy's political landscape was during this era. This story I'm going to recount is about diplomacy, as much as it is about war. It's about geography, ideology, and larger-than-life characters whose exploits were legendary even in their own time. It transcends continents, ranging from Uruguay to the Horn of Africa, from Palermo to New York City, and Montevideo to Addis Ababa. People like Buenarote, Mezzanini, Garibaldi, and Cavour, even with their contradictions and dislikes, their quirks and their attitudes, they opposed the opinions of many other conservative nations during their time and went on to form a nation of their own through sheer force of will. They persevered in the face of apathy, colonialism, and outright cultural takeover in order to expunge the racist 19th century belief that nations were simply amalgamations of people who were homogeneous, sounded comprehensible to one another, and shared similar ideological and daily practices. In the period after the Napoleonic Wars, the Austrian prince and diplomat Metternich famously said, quote, Italy exists only as a geographic expression, unquote. For many Italian dukes and petty kings, their national survival in the wars of Europe depended heavily on their allies. Traditionally, they could rely on the support of France or Austria, who were always major geopolitical players in the Italian peninsula and the Mediterranean world. In fact, without French support, there never would have been an Italian nation. It's very easy to conceive that had the Bonaparte family never existed, Italy might not have been unified even to this day. Imagine a central Italian state controlled by the Pope in 2022 or how Sicily might approach geopolitical relations with North African countries. More than likely, however, Italy would have coalesced at some point, especially with the emergence of nationalism in the 19th century and its continued proliferation into the 20th. The year of 1796 brings the French Revolution into full swing in Italy. French citizen armies are fighting against the combined coalition of Austria, England, Russia, and Spain for the preservation of their new French Republic. So far, the revolution had been sputtering and losing ground. 
In Paris, the Committee of Public Safety was guillotining those who were too radical before moving on to anyone who was too conservative. The terror was the first sign that the French Republic was deeply terrified and unstable. The Jacobin leader, Robespierre, was quickly overthrown, executed, and replaced by the Directory, which would spend the following months recovering from their former government's atrocities and mismanagement. In their attempt to win the war, they desperately threw their political weight behind a wild card. This man was a young military officer who nearly died leading his men in an assault against a fort decked with cannons which were packed with canister shot. His name was Napoleon Bonaparte. Once an impoverished middle-class Corsican, he nearly committed suicide years prior, credited to the lack of mobility in the French officer corps. Now he was the new leader of the faltering Army d'Italie. Anyways, what is a Republican government? The Encyclopedia of Britannica states that it is, quote, a form of government in which the state is ruled by representatives of the citizen body. Modern republics are founded on the idea that sovereignty rests with the people, though who is included and excluded from the category of the people has varied across history. Unquote. A constitution was seen by many as the one clear fire way that a citizen's rights could be protected from the government. Now, the first Italian constitution was put into place in 1797 by the Ligurian Republic. The following is a direct excerpt. Quote, Article 1. The Ligurian Republic is one and indivisible. Article 2. The totality of the Ligurian citizens is the sovereign. Article 3. Liberty and equality are the basis of the Republic. Article 4. The Ligurian Republic preserves intact the Christian Roman Catholic religion which it has professed for centuries. Article 5. The Ligurian Republic offers special protection to industry, commerce, the arts, and sciences. Article 6. It defends all property rights. Unquote. Comparatively, this is an excerpt from the Constitution of the Italian Republic of 1808. Quote, Article 1. The Roman Catholic apostolic religion is the religion of the state. Article 2. Sovereignty resides in the universality of the citizens. Article 10. Three electoral colleges, namely the College of the Men of Property, that of the Men of Learning, and that of the Merchants, are the basic organs of national sovereignty. Article 20. The College of the Men of Property consists of 300 citizens, chosen among all the Republic's property owners, who, from real estate, derive an annual rent of no less than 6,000 lire. Unquote. Conservatism had crept its way back into the Italian Republic to even the scales after this revolutionary period. Not to be outdone, the Sicilians demanded a constitution of their own from their Bourbon king, Ferdinand. The king acquiesced, and in 1812 he consecrated the Sicilian constitution thanks to excessive diplomatic pressure from the British. In the Constitution, Ferdinand states, quote, We, Ferdinand III, by God's grace, King of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, having convoked an extraordinary general parliament, according to the wishes of the nation, provide royal sanction that the legislative power resides exclusively in parliament, that the judiciary will be distinct and independent that no Sicilian will be arrested, exiled, or in any other way punished and troubled in the possession and enjoyment of his rights and property." Unquote. Things in 1796 France worked a little differently, to say the least. The newest iteration of the people's will was the aforementioned directory. It was a bicameral legislature, meaning there were two chambers of legislature, much like the current American government. These two houses are where the similarities stop, however. The two chambers are as follows. First, the Council of 500, who were elected representatives of the people. They proposed legislation. Then came the Council of the Ancients. They were 250 representatives who could pass or veto legislation brought before them. These ancients chose the directors from lists provided by the 500, and new directors were chosen annually on a rotating basis. They had the same powers as the previous government in name only. They could not fund projects nor have their ideas backed in court. 
The Directory was notoriously inept to the point that the basic needs of their citizens were not being met. One of the few things they managed to accomplish was changing the calendar from the classic Gregorian style to a rational calendar. This rational calendar still included 12 months, but none of the months' names were the same. For example, most of April was called Germinal, while most of November was now called Brumaire. Instead of four weeks in a month, there were three weeks in a month. Instead of seven days a week, a week was now 10 days. Even hours and minutes weren't spared. Instead of 60 minute hours, an hour was now 100 minutes, and a minute was now 100 seconds. In the quest to make things easier, the directory found out the hard way that this approach can make legislating oh so much more difficult. This and various other factors led to the coup of 1799, which placed Napoleon at the head of a dictatorship where he would eventually go on to be named Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte I. Napoleon was one of the great tactical minds of his generation. He helped change the political systems of large swathes of Europe, doing away with thousands of years of feudalism that brought to a grinding halt upward mobility in most parts of Europe. He influenced numerous Republican rebellions in places like Haiti, which was a French colony at the time, and a great portion of South America. His style of war-making was revolutionary, not for his use of superior technology, but because of his impeccable tactical acumen and an aggressive nature few military leaders could muster the zeal for. His leadership abilities were uncanny, even though he was often outnumbered. Using a highly refined French administrative and logistical system, alongside divide-and-conquer tactics, he wrecked army after army that was sent against his forces. But that is part of the story still to come. For now, the 27-year-old Napoleon Bonaparte would face down a combined Piedmont-Austrian army. Now in this situation, if it were me, I would probably try to fall back and regroup. Maybe fight defensively where I could, try to conserve the manpower of my army. What set Napoleon apart is that he opted for the offensive and made a point to get there first. Within a few weeks of leading this ragtag army of 30,000, Napoleon's troops won the Battle of Montanete on April 12th. Following his routing of the Piedmont forces, he interposed his army between the Austrians and their Piedmontese allies. Within another two weeks, Napoleon's army pushed all the way into Turin, forcing the bedraggled Piedmontese to sue for peace. Meanwhile, Austrian forces were in full retreat. When Napoleon finally caught up with their rear guard, he dismantled it at Lodi, destroying at least 50% of the opposing troops. Throughout that summer and fall, Napoleon led his armies to massive victories against the reeling Austrians at Castiglione and Bassano. He captured Milan in 1796 and then began a siege of the great fortress city of Mantua, while the 30,000-strong Austrian army was still inside. Another Austrian army, led by Joseph Alvinsky, marched over the Alps to attempt to relieve the starving garrison. They were beaten back by Bonaparte at Arcola in a grueling three-day fight. The impetuous Joseph would not be denied, however. He headed toward his final showdown with Napoleon. His 28,000 men met Napoleon's army of 21,000 on the cold morning of January 14, 1797, by the scenic little town of Rivoli, the first battle for the heart of Italy was about to begin. Before we dive into the details of this confrontation, I think it's important to speak on what set the armies of France apart from their Austrian counterparts, especially during a battle like Rivoli, where the French army's advantage was clear. French troops had the division, an organizational component of their army, so effective it is still used today by all major militaries. It allowed flexibility and independent initiative to be demonstrated by the commanders of each division. A French army's division consisted of about three to four brigades. Each brigade consisted of about two to three thousand men, leaving each division with anywhere from six to twelve thousand men. This wasn't constant. Some divisions were smaller or larger, depending on when and where you were. To put it in perspective... Imagine if you had the ability to move multiple pawns at the same time in a game of chess. 
If you could do that, but your opponent was stuck moving only one piece at a time, you could have a significantly improved chance of winning. This is what it was like to fight as a division. The Austrians could not be as flexible as the French. They would come to find themselves in tactical quagmires. Their brigades were often out in the open, cut off, and surrounded. This was usually a result of inept generalship or unforgiving terrain. In addition to the French system's organizational superiority, Napoleon's troops had another tool for which the European infantry was not ready, the column. It was a nine ranks deep attack formation. The column utilized the disorganized hordes of the French citizen armies in the revolutionary period, turning them into fast, efficient utility warriors who could conceivably be used as a human bludgeon. They could be dispersed to act as skirmishers or light infantry. They could even form lines and send consecutive volleys at the enemy. R. Ernest and Trevor Dupuy clearly state in the Encyclopedia of Military History, quote, The great tactical value of the column lay in its flexibility and versatility. It permitted the commander to move large numbers of men over the battlefield with better control and far more rapidly than had been possible before. The column could operate in hilly terrain. It could easily change into different formations." Unquote. The question of morale was another decisive factor. For peasants on the French side who were conscripted into service, they were more likely to stand and fight under a French banner, mostly because the French government convinced the population that the average Frenchman was fighting for more than himself. He was fighting for liberty, equality, and fraternity. Whereas the average Austrian or Russian was fighting simply because that's what they were ordered to do. The final factor which led to Napoleon's victory must lay in the use of massed artillery as an offensive weapon. This is the first time in history that artillery was used offensively. French guns would cause chaos on allied positions wherever they found them on the battlefield, and the ensuing bombardment would often leave the soldiers dazed and confused. At this point, the French infantry would descend on their position and destroy it entirely. So, after four bungled attempts to relieve the fortress city of Mantua, Joseph Alvinsky placed all of his hopes in crushing the French army, saving the besieged garrison at Mantua, and securing Austria's imperial ambitions in northern Italy. Joseph snatched a page from his adversary's playbook and gambled on a very complex double envelopment. He would split his army six different ways, with three wings attacking Napoleon head-on, two wings swinging around Napoleon's flank, and the final attack encircling the French lines from behind. This required perfect timing and execution, which the Austrian forces were lacking that day. The three offensive lines converged in the center of the Rivoli Plateau. They met Joubert's division, who were holding the mountain pass at the small chapel of San Marco. Napoleon stood with his men. He knew he had to hold the enemy here or risk his lines of communication and supply being cut, not to mention the months of campaigning and thousands of lives lost. He had to wait for the rest of his army to consolidate itself, but his other division was still some miles off. Despite the heroism displayed by Joubert's division, they eventually fell back due to the sheer force of the Austrian frontal attack. To make matters much worse, the first units of the Austrians' two flanking wings started arriving, while Napoleon and his men continued to hold against all hope. Within a few moments, French flags were waving over the crest of the plateau, however. Messina's division, with its lead brigade headed by a young officer named Joachim Marat, arrived just in time to save their fellow Frenchmen from the Austrians' attempt at envelopment. The final Austrian wing bungled its way into position and was bowled over easily by the fresh French reinforcements. The army of Italy was saved from certain destruction and proceeded to kill, maim, or capture over 50% of Alvinsky's army by the end of the day. After this stunning debacle, the Austrian garrison of Mantua capitulated and effectively ended 400 years of Austrian hegemony in north-central Italy. In response to this surrender, Napoleon invaded and destroyed the thousand-year-old Venetian Republic, as well as the Papal States. He went on to invade Austria itself and put Vienna under siege. 
Throughout the entirety of their Italian campaign, the Army d'Italie lost approximately 20,000 men. However, they ended up inflicting 70,000 casualties upon the Austrian forces, while capturing another 400 cannons. The first priority of the French authorities was the forcible transfer of millions in Italian gold. To quote Christopher Duggan's book, The Force of Destiny, Milan was saddled with an immediate indemnity of 20 million francs, Modena, 7.5 million, Parma, with 2 million, unquote. This is nothing of the millions extracted in peace treaties, let alone the irreplaceable works of art, literature, and manuscripts hauled away to France. The most defended city being Venice, which was ransacked by the French in 1798. The works of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment were now housed in Paris to improve the, quote, cultural prestige, unquote, of the New Republic. Many still remain there, with unquantifiable value. France still possesses 13 original Leonardo da Vinci manuscripts. The wedding feast at Cana still hangs at the Louvre Museum, and four bronze horses that symbolized Venetian rule for a thousand years now stand guard around the Arc de Triomphe. This was too much for Ugo Foscola to bear. The young Republican, who once praised Napoleon, now considered him a bitter enemy. In his famous book, The Last Letters of Jacopo Ortiz, he tells the story of a Venetian man forced to flee his native country. He falls in love with a young woman, symbolizing Italy, who is already betrothed to a French marquis. In the end, the protagonist kills himself, unable to be with the woman he loves and unable to return to the land of his birth. This would go on to symbolize the quote-unquote masculine struggle to free beautiful Italy from foreign infatuation. In January of 1798, French authorities brazenly invaded the Papal States. At this, the Pope fled Rome. Liberal revolutionaries were marching with French soldiers, but the power of the church, especially in the countryside, was immense. Cities were stormed by mobs of religious zealots, and whole French garrisons were slaughtered. In response, the French brutally suppressed risings in central Italy. While the siege of Vienna dragged on, the impatient Napoleon negotiated the terms of the Treaty of Camp Formo without the approval of the Directory. In the treaty, Napoleon negotiated the formation of multiple new Italian republics, the opinion among many historians is that this treaty marked the beginning of the Risorgimento. Napoleon left his lieutenants to manage his conquests and promptly departed for Egypt with an army of 40,000. There, he intended to cut the British Empire in two, colonize the Egyptian Mamluks, and crush any Turkish resistance. His hope, soon after, was to invade India. This hasty invasion led directly to the War of the Second Coalition, in the ensuing battles, Austria, Russia, and Britain doubled their efforts to check French expansion in Italy with a Russo-Austrian invasion. The man who led this invasion, Alexander Vysuvarov, is probably the most ill-recognized general in military history. He dedicated 40 years of his life to service under the Russian Tsarina, Catherine the Great. And even after that, he returned for the War of the Second Coalition under Emperor Paul. Very few generals can say they have never lost a battle. Suvorov is on that list. The difference between generals like Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great and Suvorov is that these generals had relatively short shelf lives, whereas Suvorov could say he fought over many eras using a variety of intricate tactics against vastly different opponents. There were no Celtic tribesmen lacking in technological know-how or tactics, as with Caesar, and there wasn't a crumbling Persian Empire who fought using mostly enslaved peoples, as with Alexander the Great. The advancement of technology across cultures meant that Suvorov had to consistently fight against well-matched Eurasian entities. This challenged him to be more cunning and aggressive than the generals of the past. He honed his skills against each new adversary in turn, defeating Polish, Turkish, French, and Persian armies. It is recorded that Suvorov held Napoleon in high esteem, considering him one of the great generals in military history. This is an interesting insight, considering Suvorov's life ended in 1800, 
before the Napoleonic Wars truly began. I often think about what would have happened if Napoleon had met Suvorov on the field of battle. However, the recorded history is just as enticing. The year is 1799, and the North and Central Republics exist as follows, the Ligurian, the Cisalpine, and the Roman Republic. The governing bodies of these fledgling republics were teetering on a knife's point in their attempt to crush revolt and insurrection by their hostile, conservative populace. In southern Italy, the Parthenopian Republic recently declared itself after a French invasion, most of the population being completely hostile to this and their new rule. With two days of street fighting only ended by an impromptu liquefaction of a local saint's blood. Along the Adige River, the French looked to launch a preemptive attack on the Austrian position, which would ruin the Allied invasion before it even began. At the Battle of Magnano, however, the French were repulsed. The offensive minded Suvorov then took control of the Allied offensive pushing the French before him in all engagements, until Turin was secured and its Savoyard king reinstated on the throne. Meanwhile, in Tuscany, Viva Maria, an army of religious zealots, took control of the city of Florence and ruthlessly exterminated Jewish people and Republicans in Siena. In the recently formed Parthenopian Republic, Cardinal Rufo began using his uh, influence in the city to indoctrinate the people with xenophobia and rally the populace into a counter-revolution. Vincenzo Cucuo, who collaborated with the Republic to write its constitution, explained the separation of classes in Naples well. Cucuo states, quote, The Neapolitan nation could be regarded as divided into two people, separated by two centuries and two climate zones. Since the educated part had been formed on foreign models, its culture was different from that which the nation as a whole needed. Unquote. While French troops withdrew over the Alps, all the land conquered by Napoleon in the campaign of 96 and 97 was lost. France was in danger of being invaded from Italy by a combined Austro Russian force consisting of at least 80,000. At this time, however, the Emperor of Russia, Paul, who was a Francophile, commanded Suvorov to waste his aggressive initiative and launch an invasion of Switzerland from the newly acquired bases in northern Italy. And so it was that at the start of the 19th century, the most well-equipped Allied general was wasting time campaigning inconclusively in the Swiss mountains. This drastic change in battlefronts left Russia out of the struggle to come in Italy. Within several months, Russia had removed itself from the war entirely, this happened just as Napoleon was about to return to Italy for an encore performance. Upon hearing the news from Europe, Napoleon left his army of Egypt to fend for itself against the combined armies of Egypt, Turkey, and Britain. When Napoleon returned to France, conservative backers aided him in dissolving both houses of parliament and creating the title of first consul for himself. This was in reference to the ancient Roman Republic's position of the same name. However, the namesake was the only similarity. This title made Napoleon the de facto dictator of France, essentially allowing him to become the most powerful person in the Western Hemisphere. He quickly declared amnesty for political prisoners, changed the calendars back to the Gregorian model, and even let clergymen deliver mass on Sundays. This gained Napoleon a significant amount of reverence from the people of France. In fact, in the plebiscite of 1800, he received 3.5 million votes, with only 1,500 people voting against him. This referendum was mostly rigged, but it allowed the new government to formally adopt Napoleon's constitution and set up the triconsulship with Napoleon as head. In an excerpt from the Napoleonic Wars, A Global History, Alexander Macabaridzi details how popular Napoleon was among Parisians at the time of the vote. One citizen is said to have written on their ballot, quote, the man who has given us peace, religion, and order in such a short space of time, unquote. Another said that Napoleon was, quote, a hero who, quote, needed to save France by bringing back joy and hope to our hearts and restoring liberty, justice, and peace, unquote. Even with all his success and power, Napoleon refused to rest on his laurels. He quickly raised new troops, the Army of Reserve, 
which he used to cross the Alps and place himself on the Austrian lines of communication. This action led directly to the Battle of Marengo on June 14th, in which Napoleon carelessly advanced his army against the superior Austrians to his front, and against all odds snatched a victory from the jaws of defeat. He had little more than a division on hand against an entire Austrian corps. His army was stretched near breaking. The nearest contingents were nearly five miles away. All through that day, the French fought and fell back, escaping disaster after disaster for two miles. The Austrians, convinced of their victory over the upstart French, halted offensive operations and began to march away. It wasn't until late afternoon when the first of Napoleon's reinforcements started arriving. At this point, Napoleon ordered a general advance on the lethargic Austrians, still in marching order, and completely unaware of the fresh forces on their flanks. In the ensuing fight, nearly half of the Austrian army was killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. The rest ran as fast as their legs could carry them from the battlefield. Twice within three years, Napoleon had turned Italy into his own personal parade ground. By December 1800, he left the Austrians no choice but to sue for peace and accept the existence of the new Italian republics and French holdings on the Rhine. In his time as de facto dictator, Napoleon can at best be considered a pragmatic realist, and at worst, a Machiavellian villain. The following excerpt describes Napoleon's tactics for dealing with the Italian vassal states. It's a letter taken from the Risorgimento and the Unification of Italy by Derek Beals and Eugenio Bagnini. Quote, The Cispidine republics are divided into three parties. First, the friends of the old government. Second, the supporters of an independent and somewhat aristocratic constitution. Thirdly, the supporters of the French constitution and pure democracy. I suppress the first, I support the second, and I moderate the third. I support the second and moderate the third because the second party is that of the rich proprietors and priests, who in the last analysis would win over the mass of people whom it is essential to rally around the French party. The last party is composed of young people, or writers and men who, as in France and in all countries, change a government and love liberty only for the sake of making a revolution." Unquote. Many Italian poets and intellectuals fell into this third category. Some even referred to Napoleon and the French Constitution as a new Prometheus, who would set ablaze the dry forest of feudalism with the fire of republicanism so that new vegetation could grow. Despite Napoleon's cynicism, the French efforts to reshape the Italian countryside was working. The Italian tricolor is directly based on the French flag. The French flag makers created the first iterations of the Italian flag that is used today. French officials worked closely with proto-Italian patriots to create the several republican constitutions mentioned earlier. These officials bridged the gap between their people so that they could start to dismantle intra-regional Italian prejudices. The barriers which were preventing social equity were mostly broken down in the officer corps of the Italian legions. There, veterans were from all walks of life, and internal promotion depended on merit, not your family name. After the Napoleonic period, life became increasingly difficult for many Italian veterans. The new powers ruling the land stripped Italian officers of their hard-won promotions, forcing the men to drop down in rank. Most times, their new superior was a foreign nobleman who had likely never seen combat. The resentment bred in this period led to the explosion of membership in secret societies like the Carbonaris and the Young Italy movement. Many of these societies were radical, and they were almost always internationally focused liberationists. If you were a member of the Young Italy movement, you believed just as much as Spanish, German, and French liberation as you did in your own. These secret societies were inherently proto-socialist and proto-communist. Later, during the first Red Scare, these groups evolved into anarchist bomb throwers who wanted to destroy the fabric of capitalist society, while other Mazzinians turned to racist, anti-democratic, right-wing beliefs. The Napoleonic era was not fruitful for all, however. 
For members of the church, this was one of the most difficult periods in Catholic history. In 1798, a French general named Berthier marched unopposed on Rome. Pope Pius VI, the longest reigning pope in history, refused to announce his temporal authority and was carried off in chains to the fortress city of Valence in France in 1799, where he later died. In addition to the removal of their pope, church-owned land in Italy was sold en masse to middle-class bourgeoisie merchants. To quote the Plain of Bologna, quote, In 1789, the church had 19% of the land, nobles 55% of the land, middle-class persons 18% of the land. In 1804, the figures were 4%, 50%, and 34%, unquote. By 1804, what were once large swaths of church land now belonged largely to the middle class. By 1809, French authorities declared the power of the papacy to be at an end. For the established order who enjoyed theocratic rule, the idea of forming a consolidated Italian republic without Catholicism was an idea worse than death. But for now, under Napoleon, the conservative population would live under a republican regime that only worked with nobility if it suited their needs. For the greater population of Italy, Napoleon's rule allowed people to generally improve their lives. In the time before this period, religious intolerance ran rampant, especially against Protestant Christians and Jewish peoples. In most parts of Italy, a papal decree forced followers of both religions to live in sectioned-off ghettos, with the idea being that Catholics could not conceivably live peacefully with, quote, heretics and infidels, unquote. This all changed with the revolution. Afterward, when their republics were formed, many liberal Italians went to the Jewish and Protestant ghettos and tore down the walls of these places by hand and embraced their fellow countrymen. The anti-Semitism, religious bigotry, and racism that was present in Europe throughout the 18th and 19th century is rarely touched on. There are people today who point to this period as the pinnacle of human progress and innovation. Some contemporary libertarians would point to 18th century Europe as a benchmark for well-meaning, hands-off, laissez-faire government. However, it is important to note that the entirety of Italy's recorded history shows otherwise. The church and ingrained landowners exerted an incredibly powerful influence on all things, often thanks to government complacency. For most Italians, the idea of freedom, even freedom with caveats and the risk of death on the battlefield, was worth it. Republican movements spread like wildfire as the political underground sprang to life. The French abolished many of the impediments on trade throughout the peninsula, introduced new administrative and civil codes, and built French roads, which connected Italian regions for the first time since the Roman Empire. Although there were benefits to Napoleon's rule, there were also severe drawbacks. The brutally efficient French tax system sucked its silver and gold from the coffers of the poorest Italians. Agriculture was also used to the government's benefit, as they only grew crops that would stave off the British blockade essentially converting Italy into a giant grain farm. This exploitation of the land also led to the first instance of Italian coffee plantations. It's hard to say definitively whether the impact of French rule was wholly positive or negative for the Italian population. On one hand, it gave radicals hope for a more egalitarian future, and many consider it the beginning of the Risorgimento, with more social equity and less emphasis on religious dogma and noble birth. The poorest people could even, potentially, advance their station. On the other hand, every single improvement was crafted with the express purpose of helping the French armies and the French state. The people of Italy were a non-factor in almost all political and infrastructural decisions. At the start of 1801, the people of France celebrated for the first time in nine years. The French Republic was at peace with the Austrian Empire. The Treaty of Lunéaville, which was signed in early February of 1801, ratified the complete change of European borders. 
Austria recognized the seizure of the West Rhine by France, giving up some 25,000 miles of land and 3.5 million inhabitants. It also recognized French gains in north-central Italy, and it gave up control of the Duchy of Tuscany and recognized the Ligurian and Cisalpine republics. After signing the Treaty of Lunéaville, Napoleon exclaimed that he was fighting, quote, only to secure the peace and happiness of the world, unquote. In March, he signed another treaty with Spain, which did away with the Duchy of Parma and created the Kingdom of Etruria with Florence as its capital and the son of the King of Spain as its constitutional monarch. This treaty also allowed France to acquire the Louisiana Territory, which it then sold at a profit to the small country of America. Napoleon also ended the seven-year-long civil war in the Vendée region of the French countryside. He signed a treaty with Naples, who ceded land to him and closed its ports to British and Turkish goods. They also agreed to pay to be protected by the French, making the kingdom little more than a French puppet. Most importantly, Napoleon signed a concordat with the Vatican, acknowledging that, while many French people were Catholic, there was no state religion in France. This was one of the first continental expressions of secularism that didn't also bring about a reign of terror against priests and the clergy. It was religious freedom. Not everyone was happy with this, of course, but most conservatives were. Radicals, however, were not. The following excerpt is from the Napoleonic Wars of Global History. Quote, It was unpopular in the army where many still retained revolutionary ideals and expressed their disappointment. When Te Deum Mass, the first in many years, was celebrated at Notre Dame on Easter Sunday, one of the generals was heard to remark, What bullshit! The only thing missing is one million men who died to get rid of all this. Unquote. The compromises with the church, to which Napoleon agreed, were used to moderate the unnecessary elements of revolution and mitigate violence against the vastly diverse French peoples. The great legacy of Napoleon is his duality. He was able to behave diplomatically when necessary, but when it came to the battlefield or insurrection, he changed his tactics and led with brute force. For every civil code and free institution he created, civil partnership, religious freedom, a comprehensive and fair tax system, there was also horrible abuse to go along with it. Unfortunately, the scales of justice are always tipped when extremely powerful figures enter the world arena. By March of 1802, France was at peace with the rest of the world for the first time in 10 years. The Treaty of Amiens was a cornerstone achievement for its time, and although the peace with Britain lasted only about a year and a half, the ramifications for Italy and the world at large would be immense. It confirmed a new balance of power in Europe with France as the hegemonic master of Western and South Central Europe, and Britain as the master of the seas in the maritime theater. Egypt was to remain under Ottoman Mamluk control, while the new republics of Italy were left off the treaty entirely, as Britain was not concerned with them. All in all, it was a huge success for France. With the newfound peace, they were able to attend to their internal issues and garrison their far-off Caribbean and East Asian colonies, some of whom had been in open revolt for years. The subjugation of their new territories in Germany, the Low Countries, and Italy was their utmost priority. From 1802 to 1803, the French presence in Italian lands became more and more outrageous. Many conservative North Italians demanded the return to their old kingdoms, while radicals demanded the fulfillment of Napoleon's promise of Italian nationhood under a free, independent republic. However, their hopes were crushed in 1803, when after weeks of failed talks with the House of Savoy, France had defied international expectations and outright annexed Piedmont to more effectively exploit the Italian countryside. By the time the French had named Napoleon the Emperor in 1804, all that remained of the original nine principalities of the peninsula was the small constituency of Lucca. Sardinia had its mainland holdings stripped and annexed by the French, along with the Duchy of Genoa and other former Tuscan and Papal lands. This left France as the direct rulers of northwest and central Italy. What was left was a brand new political entity, the Republic soon to be the Kingdom of Italy. 
its capital city being Milan under the rule of Emperor Napoleon, with his stepson, Eugenio de Bohaniers, as the royal viceroy and heir. This new kingdom had to fashion thousands of troops to Napoleon's army and supply millions of francs to Napoleon's treasury. Throughout the Napoleonic Wars, some 200,000 men from the Kingdom of Italy fought for the French. Whole divisions fought in Spain and distinguished themselves, especially at Saguntum and Tarragona. And in the final battles of the Napoleonic Wars, 27,000 Italians fought in the frozen plains of Russia, earning renown at Borodino. Only 1,000 Italians returned alive. The rest of the troops were killed or died of exposure. Despite the plethora of casualties, it is said that they returned with nearly all their banners and flags intact. In 1806, the French army poured into the southern boot of Italy. The Bourbon king of Naples, Ferdinand, had unwisely put his trust in the Allied powers, and in a single battle, the entire Neapolitan army was destroyed, though mostly through desertion. The king and his court now fled to Sicily protected from invasion by the British Royal Navy, but completely cut off from the Italian peninsula until the end of the war. This led to the creation of an entirely new kingdom of Naples under the emperor's brother, Joseph Bonaparte. Although most of the Bourbon troops were able to escape to Sicily, some 7,000 were still held up defiantly in the fortress city of Gaeta. So determined was their resistance that Joachim Murat, now head of the army of Naples, sent the majority of his forces to destroy the garrison. As this happened, the people of Calabria revolted against their French oppressors. Calabria is the southernmost part of the Italian peninsula. Its inhabitants were traditionally very poor, always quick to hold grudges and not very welcoming of outsiders. At this time, and for decades after, it was a hotbed for mercenaries and brigands of various political and moral stripes. They wreaked havoc against the French, so much so that the British were able to land a force of some 5,000 men behind French lines and win a victory on the Italian shore against the French-Polish division. The British ended up returning to their boats and did not follow up with this invasion. Despite its success, they were disgusted with reprisals they witnessed against their French enemies at the hands of the native Calabrians. The garrison of Gaeta surrendered some weeks later, freeing up French troops to assist in ruthlessly suppressing the Calabrian Rebellion. In the end, there's no figure for how many native Italians died in the brutal fighting, but upwards of 20,000 French soldiers died throughout the revolts and fighting in Italy, mostly in the south. In 1808, after years of victory and conquest, Napoleon made an unwise decision to replace the King of Spain and his heir with Joseph Bonaparte. Joseph was forced to accept the task, despite his current responsibilities to the Kingdom of Naples. In his stead, Napoleon appointed his brother-in-law, Joachim Murat, the first horseman of Europe, as the new king. Of all Napoleon's lieutenants, Murat was for sure the most complicated. He is someone who was admired for his bravery in every field on which he fought. He led France's cavalry successfully and with distinction throughout most of the Napoleonic Wars. Yet Marat also dreaded the idea of killing. It is recorded that he said, quote, What gives me the most heartfelt satisfaction when I think of my military career is that I have never seen a man fall killed by my hand. If a man had ever fallen dead before me by my act, the picture of it would pursue me to my grave. Unquote. Although Marat had an aversion to killing soldiers on the field of battle, he was not above stabbing his brethren in the back. He eventually betrayed Napoleon and secretly put his support behind the Allies when he knew that Napoleon was going to lose the war. History is filled with people like this, those who will always put their best interests before that of others. I know people like this today. There's something very human about saving yourself. So let's get into how something like this could happen. The year is 1812. The Italian peninsula is practically pacified. Only the islands of Sicily and Sardinia remain unconquered by the French. Napoleon has conquered Europe despite annoying guerrilla raids on his Spanish flank. He referred to this as his, quote, Spanish ulcer, unquote. 
French satellites and dependencies ranged from Madrid to Warsaw and Berlin to the Hungarian plain. But not all was as it seemed. Years of foreign exploitation had left Germany, Italy, Spain, and the Netherlands fed up with the French Empire's state of affairs. Not to mention the French soldiers who often treated them as conquered subjects instead of honored allies. In Prussia and Austria, new nationalistic and pan-German sentiments were just beginning to spread through the agitated and humiliated German population. In Italy, the same writers and intellectuals who once supported the revolutionary ideals of the French nation were disheartened by the situation. As they saw it, the French were clearly exploiting them, and their military men were returning with horror stories from the Spanish towns and cities in which they fought and watched friends die. To compound this, the Napoleonic system, which was intended to stop trade to the British Isles in order to cut Britain off from the rest of the world, was a complete disaster. Great port cities like Amsterdam, Venice, and Marseille became ghost towns as less and less shipping was done through sea lanes. The interior cities flourished, while port cities were brought to ruin as the British blockade tightened. Meanwhile, the British enjoyed more and more free access to the sea, as their superiority in maritime affairs won out time and again. They still had lucrative trade with the continent, despite the supposed blockade against all British goods. The black market flourished. Marat was one of the principal offenders, accepting British grain by the tons during his reign as King of Naples. Many French officials took part in black market trading as well, so it might be a bit unfair to only single out Marat. However, the fact that he was involved exemplifies the systemic failure of the Napoleonic system. This system was designed and fueled by conquest. The second the wars stopped, the French coffers sputtered. On several occasions, Napoleon had to make personal donations to the public funds of France in order to keep things running. Imagine if Donald Trump had given any of the supposed billions of dollars he has to the Fed or deposited gold bouillon directly in the Fort Knox. But I digress. The cracks of the Napoleonic system had been widening for a long time. And after nearly a decade of war, the exhaustion of the French Elan, or fighting spirit, was apparent. When Napoleon ordered the creation of a final grand French army, the rest of the world could almost hear the collective moan of parents sending their sons to war, knowing that they may never see their baby again. The final army was a full 685,000 men strong. It consisted of 40,000 cavalry under Marat. 50,000 imperial guardsmen were of the old guard, the elite fighting men of France. And the young guard, which contained several foreign legions hailing from Switzerland, Poland, and Portugal, in addition to their native French peoples. The first corps under Devaux had some 79,000 men and five infantry divisions. The second and third corps each had 40,000 men, while another central army had 81,000, and a right flank army had some 60,000 Westphalians and Poles. All in all, 255,000 men were French. 20,000 were from the annexed Belgian and Dutch lowlands. Another 20,000 were from the annexed North German and Northwest Italian provinces. Nearly 108,000 soldiers were Polish. About 20,000 of them joined as a result of the campaigning in Lithuania. 111,000 were various Germans from the Confederation of the Rhine. We already spoke of the 27,000 from the Kingdom of Italy, but there were also 8,000 Neapolitans who were held in reserve in Germany, not to mention 9,000 Swiss. 5,000 Spanish, 3,000 Croats, 6,000 Illyrian and Slavic peoples, 20,000 Prussian, 10,000 Danish, and a 34,000 multi-ethnic Austrian corps. Although time would prove him wrong, Napoleon promised the people of Europe that after this final campaign, there would be no more war. He insisted that his regime, composed mostly of his own family members, would keep the peace. The Habsburg and Bourbon families would have given anything to obtain as much power as the Bonaparte family had. 
Even so, if Napoleon had his way, a good portion of the world would have been under his direct command. Once the Russians were dealt with, he could finally turn toward England with the continent behind him and pacified, and at the mercy of his will. He would be the master not just of France, but also of the political destinies of dozens of states and tens of millions of people. Imagine how different the world would be if Napoleon had succeeded. French might have been taught as a secondary language in India. Napoleon and his family might appear on banknotes. Perhaps a special relationship would have been cultivated with America on the basis of liberty, equality, and fraternity, as well as the promise of revolution. We could speculate about the what-ifs endlessly. But for now, the reality remained that the tides were turning for Napoleon's grand army. By the end of the year, they would find themselves frozen in place, literally, as 90% of the army that entered Russia never came back. Things went from bad to worse as the French crossed into Prussia, which was little more than a vassal of the Napoleonic Empire. The Prussian contingent of the French army switched sides when they returned to their homeland, and upon hearing this, the entire country revolted. In no time at all, the Prussians had hundreds of thousands of fighting men resisting French occupation. Indeed, they had been planning the switch the whole time. Then, in 1813, Austria declared war on the French Empire. The spiraling Grand Army fell back all the way to central Germany, where they once watched Moscow burn in the snow. The Allies could now boast that they had 450,000 men in their new coalition, while Napoleon could barely muster 300,000. The final nail was about to be placed in the coffin of French hegemony. The plan was to fall back when confronted by Napoleon and slowly converge all Allied forces upon the Grand Army. He ended up losing all that he had gained by doing exactly what the Allies wanted. Gone were the days of the old Elan. Those troops were all dead or maimed. In 1796, being outnumbered did not shake him, but his aggressive spirit was gone, and so was any hope of victory. So he hunkered down in Leipzig and waited for the Allies. In October of 1813, the Allied armies finally managed the convergence. In the north, the Prussians, led by the future hero of Waterloo, Gerhard von Blücher, began the attack as the Russo-Austrian army advanced on the French position from the south and center. For three days, the Allied armies utilized the frontal assault, fighting tooth and nail for every inch of ground they gained trying to pin Napoleon's army in place. The French, though severely outnumbered, were still holding while inflicting severe casualties on the Allied forces. But on the third day of the fight, the Swedes appeared behind the city of Leipzig, under the former French general, who was now the Swedish king, Bernadotte. The German contingent of Napoleon's army, filled with about 5,000 Saxon and Württembergian men, now dropped their weapons and refused to fight. It wasn't because they were disloyal. They simply admired and respected Bernadotte. This was a man who fought against these same forces under a French flag years ago and treated every prisoner he captured with respect and full honors. This was the main reason he was offered the kingship of Sweden by the country's electors. This was, however, effectively the end of the battle, and Napoleon and his marshals knew it. In the frenzied retreat that followed, the one and only effective bridge across the White Elster River was destroyed prematurely. With its explosion, it sent pieces of concrete, human body parts, and the heads of horses flying through the air. It also left tens of thousands of French vulnerable to capture, as they were on the wrong side of the river. Although Napoleon and part of his army escaped, the end was nigh. As they left the hills of Germany and entered the fields of France, the cries of liberty, equality, fraternity seemed distant hollow echoes as they followed their emperor to their collective ruin. In the end, the Battle of Nations, or the Battle of Leipzig, was one of the most crucial battles in modern history after probably the defense of Stalingrad in World War II. This signified the end of French Empire in Central and Southern Europe. 
It had major ramifications for the Confederation of the Rhine and Italy especially. Of the nearly 560,000 soldiers involved in the battle, 133,000 were casualties, with 79,000 being French and 54,000 being allies. It was the largest battle in European history up until this point, and it was one that would not be replicated in terms of men and casualties until the horrors of trench warfare in World War I. After this battle, the French satellites were basically told they were on their own. Marat secretly switched sides to the Allies, and Napoleon's stepson, Bohaniers, rushed to be crowned a king of Italy and prepare the defenses for the imminent Austrian invasion. Some 35,000 Austrians invaded northeastern Italy. In early 1814, Bohaniers decided to make his stand on the Mincio River with his combined 34,000 French and Italian forces. What happened next is a messy and inconclusive engagement. Not much is recorded about this battle, except that the losses were about the same on both sides. Three to 4,000 casualties apiece. A short time after this fight, Napoleon abdicated the throne, effectively bringing an end to the French Empire in Europe. On May 20th, 1814, Bohaniers was also forced to abdicate after one of his ministers was murdered by a raucous crowd in Milan. This sparked a nationwide series of protests and revolts in support of Lombard self-rule. Bohaniers fled Italy and returned to the loving embrace of his father-in-law, the King of Bavaria. He was then made the Count of Leuchtenberg, where he remained neutral during Napoleon's shocking return to power. He lived the rest of his life expanding his art collection and lobbying for better treatment of his stepfather, Napoleon. Bohaniers died on February 14, 1824, after several strokes, when he was 42 years old. Back in Milan, the aristocrats attempted to form a government composed of an enlarged Lombardy. This would make them a part of the Austrian Empire as a semi-independent state, much like Hungary. Austria was not moved by these arguments for Italian self-government. When all else failed, the Italian aristocrats appealed to the Austrians by citing their ancient rights and Italian heritages in order to govern the northern Italian state. These series of negotiations with Austria are considered by many to be the start of classical Italian liberalism. However, these negotiations proved to be futile, as Veneto and Lombardy were annexed directly to the Austrian Empire. In the Kingdom of Naples, Joachim Murat had remained in power, but his position was tenuous, to say the least. He was the only former Napoleonic satellite to keep hold of his throne. The Austrians were rightfully suspicious of Murat, and they always kept an army of 100,000 on hand just in case. On March 15, 1815, Murat preemptively declared war on Austria and issued the Rimini Declaration. This document called for the unification of the Italian peninsula, in which Italians would revolt against their Austrian overlords. It was substantial in that it was the first time that a leader in any country openly advocated for Italian liberty and unity. French powers had always planned to make Italy into a massive bread and wheat factory in order to aid French expansion. In the Rimini Declaration, Murat states, quote, Italians, the hour has come that your high destinies must be fulfilled. Providence calls you to be an independent nation. From the Alps to the Straits of Celia, there is a single cry, the independence of Italy. In what capacity do they dominate your most beautiful districts? In what capacity do they take your riches to transport them to regions where they were not born? Clear all foreign dominions from Italian soil. Once masters of the world, atone for this with 20 centuries of oppression and massacres. 80,000 Italians from the states of Naples marched under the command of their king. He's talking about himself, Murat and swore not to ask for rest until after the liberation of Italy. Italians of other districts second the magnanimous design. Those who use them among you should return to arms and train inexperienced youth to use them. 
It is a question of deciding whether Italy should be free or bend its humiliated front to servitude for centuries. I appeal to you, good and unhappy Italians of Milan, Bologna, Turin, Venice, Brescia, Modena, Reggio, and as many illustrious and oppressed regions. How many brave warriors and virtuous patriots quick from their native country. Unite in close union and in a government of your choice, a truly national representation, a constitution worthy of the century and of you. Guarantee your internal freedom and property as soon as your courage will have guaranteed independence. Unquote. Murat closes this address with independent Italy. His attempts to ferment an uprising in the Italian peninsula never materialized. However, years later, many Italian patriots were worried that one of Murat's ancestors could come back and attempt to take over Naples. The contradictions were just too evident, however. A French general, the brother of Napoleon by marriage, would be the leader of a free and united Italy. In addition to this fact, years of incessant warfare had left the population completely exhausted. Most military-aged men were fighting and dying by the tens of thousands every month. The rest were apathetic to his decree, at best. The Ramini Declaration, however, jump-started a rejuvenated push toward intellectualism and the regeneration of Italy. Although the Declaration called for revolution, it also conjured the ghost of the Roman Empire, which had long ago stretched its imperial arm through Italy to hold the Mediterranean world in its vice-like grip. Murat was ultimately unsuccessful. This last-ditch attempt to inspire a rebellion was a desperate ploy to win a war he knew he would lose. The Kingdom of Sicily, governed by the Bourbon monarch Ferdinand, and the resurgent Austrian Empire were armed to the teeth and ready to stomp out the last embers of republicanism in Italy. Throughout the Neapolitan War, or the Brothers' War, which lasted from March 15th to May 20th of 1815, Murat's men were thoroughly outclassed in nearly all engagements. Although he claimed to have 80,000 loyal Italian volunteers under arms, there were, in reality, only 50,000 Italian conscripts going against some 120,000 battle-hardened Austrians. After several defeats, his lieutenants were forced to sign the Treaty of Casalanza on May 23rd, as the Austrians entered Naples and restored Ferdinand to the throne. Murat, meanwhile, was stowed away on a ship headed for Corsica. He intended to regroup and eventually reclaim his kingdom, convinced that Italians would revolt against Ferdinand when they saw their true king return. He landed in Piso in October of 1815, very near the site of the Calabrian uprisings, which he brutally crushed. To his intense surprise, he was not welcomed back like a king. Instead, he lived like a fugitive for several days until Neapolitan troops caught up and arrested him. He was charged by Ferdinand with treason and sentenced to be shot by firing squad. The night before his execution, when asked if he had any request, he asked only to have a bath prepared for him, and if he could be peppered with a bottle of Oude Cologne. On the day of his execution, October 13th, 1815, he was walked to the site where he was to die. The firing squad was composed solely of men who had served under him in the old army. Now this was no mistake. This was a direct order from King Ferdinand. I suppose the king thought it an apt penance for their disloyalty to him and his awesome divine power. Was this fair? Did Marat deserve death? Did those soldiers deserve the horrid task that was set to them? Even Napoleon wasn't sentenced to death, nor was his stepson. Not even his brother Joseph, who was king of Naples before Marat. None of these men faced the same fate. So, what did Marat do that was so egregious? Regardless, upon seeing his former soldiers distraught at the thought of killing 
their commander. Rat is supposed to have said, quote, If you wish to spare me, aim for my heart. Unquote. His final request was that no bandage be placed over his eyes. He was 48 years old. Ferdinand and his Austrian masters had shot Marat, and in so doing, they hoped to kill the idea of Italian independence. Indeed, throughout the European continent, dozens of Slavic and Germanic peoples were experiencing a nationalist awakening. France had opened a Pandora's box, spreading the intellectual contagion of democracy and republicanism to the people of Europe. By the time the Russo-British-Austrian-Prussian alliance toppled French control, millions of people had already been converted to the French model of thinking. No longer could they seriously consider feudalism as a viable alternative. The resulting Congress of Vienna and its codification after Napoleon's last stand at Waterloo rewrote the map of Europe. After the Congress, the Italian peninsula was divided once more. Venice and Lombardy were given directly to Austria. The Papal States were reintroduced. Millions of people who lived under a separation of church and state for years were thrust back into theocracy. The ghettos created for Protestant and Jewish people went back up virtually overnight. Sardinia was given back its mainland assets and could now be called the Kingdom of Sardinia Piedmont again. Not to mention the new Austrian dukes of places like Tuscany, Parma, and Modena and countless other ducal and ecclesiastical estates, which returned to suck the lifeblood of Italy, its people, and its institutions. Religious fundamentalism and regression were the orders of the day. The Austrian Empire wielded its power over Italy, just as France had done, with reckless abandon. They now had direct control over policy and decision-making in the smaller dukedoms, along with vast sway and political opinion in the Papal States and the newly fused Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. The Papal States, in fact, were to be guarded by French and Austrian troops up until the 1870s. Try as they might with their repressive tactics and outright thickness, they could not get rid of democracy. Italy's Austrian dukes even tried to persuade people not to use French roads. Despite Austria's theocratic and regressive policies, secret societies, which were already on the rise in Napoleon's era, exploded in popularity. The first advocates for political, social, and economic rights were born of this period, having got their start in Napoleon's satellite kingdoms. Without Napoleon and the French Revolution, socialism and fascism might not have materialized the way they did later in the century. The ideas of liberty, equality, and fraternity were easy to transmute into socialist, communist, and humanist rhetoric. However, nationalist movements, which were initially well-meaning, abused these same concepts, resorting quickly to violence and racism, Italy unfortunately being one of the main offenders. The march of history will not stop. This much is clear. Without this period of upheaval and extraordinary change, the modern world might not be so modern. Without the courage, it took humans to progress and adapt through periods of great uncertainty. We might all still be hunter-gatherers foraging for food, lacking medicine and industry. Without technological and cultural advancement, the world would be stagnant. Science would not be the dynamic, ever-changing quest for knowledge that it is today. Our history might not have even been recorded. Regardless, we cannot change history, just like we can't change the weather. The events are ironclad. If we refuse to accept reality and learn from history's lessons, we will face the same challenges again and again until we do. Those who seek power over others those who wish to maintain the quote-unquote inherent order of society, lead themselves blind to the change happening around them. They call progress unnatural. They close their doors to it. They even try to kill it. Despite their aversion to change, the tides of history have kept turning. 
This was no secret to the people of Italy. And the authorities of Europe were about to find out the hard way. But we'll have to save that for the next episode of Turning Tides.